Chapter 11 of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Aslan is Nearer. Edmund, meanwhile, had been having a most disappointing time. When the dwarf had gone to get the sledge ready, he expected that the witch would start being nice to him, as she had been in their last meeting. But she said nothing at all. And when at last Edmund plucked up his courage to say, Please, your majesty, can I have some Turkish delight? You, you said, she answered, silence, fool. Then she appeared to change her mind and said to herself, and yet it would not do to have the brat fainting on the way. And once more clapped her hands. Another dwarf appeared. Bring the human creature food and drink, she said. The dwarf went away and presently returned, bringing an iron bowl with some water in it and an iron plate with a hunk of dry bread on it. He grinned in a repulsive manner as he set them down on the floor beside Edmund and said, Turkish delight for the little prince? Ha, ha, ha. Take it away, said Edmund sulkily. I don't want dry bread. But the witch suddenly turned on him with such a terrible expression on her face that he apologized and began to nibble at the bread, though it was so stale he could hardly get it down. You may be glad enough of it before you taste bread again, said the witch. While he was still chewing away, the first dwarf came back and announced that the sledge was ready. The white witch rose and went out, ordering Edmund to go with her. The snow was again falling as they came into the courtyard, but she took no notice of that and made Edmund sit beside her on the sledge. But before they drove off, she called Malgram, and he came bounding like an enormous dog to the side of the sledge. Take with you the swiftest of your wolves, and go at once to the house of the beavers, said the witch, and kill whatever you find there. If they are already gone, then make all speed to the stone table, but do not be seen. Wait for me there in hiding. I meanwhile must go many miles to the west before I find a place where I can drive across the river. You may overtake these humans before they reach the stone table. You will know what to do if you find them. I hear and obey, O queen, growled the wolf, and immediately he shot away into the snow and darkness as quickly as a horse can gallop. In a few minutes he had called another wolf and was with him down on the dam, sniffing at the beaver's house. But of course they found it empty. It would have been a dreadful thing for the beavers and the children if the night had remained fine, for the wolves would have been able to follow their trail, and ten to one would have overtaken them before they had got to the cave. But now that the snow had begun again, the scent was cold, and even the footprints were covered up. <clears throat> Meanwhile, the dwarf whipped up the reindeer, and the witch and Edmund drove out under the archway and on and away into the darkness and cold. This was a terrible journey for Edmund, who had no coat. Before they had been going quarter of an hour, all the front of him was covered with snow. He soon stopped trying to shake it off, because as quickly as he did that, a new lot gathered, and he was so tired. Soon he was wet to the skin, and oh, how miserable he was. It didn't look now if the, as if the witch intended to make him a king. All the things <clears throat> he had said to make himself believe that she was good and kind and that her side was really the right side sounded to him silly now. He would have given anything to meet the others at this moment, even Peter. The only way to comfort himself now was to try to believe that the whole thing was a dream and that he might wake up at any moment. 
And as they went on, hour after hour, it did come to seem like a dream. <clears throat> this lasted longer than I can describe, even if I wrote pages and pages about it. But I will skip on to the time when the snow had stopped <clears throat> and the morning had come and they were racing down along in the daylight. And still they went on and on with no sound but the everlasting swish of the snow and the creaking of the reindeer's harness. And then at last the witch said, What have we here? Stop! And they did. <clears throat> Now Edmund hoped she was going to say something about breakfast, but she had stopped for quite a different reason. A little way off at the foot of the tree sat a merry party, a squirrel and his wife with their children, and two satyrs, and a dwarf and an old dog fox, all on stools round a table. Edmund couldn't quite see what they were eating, but it smelled lovely and there seemed to be decorations of holly, and he wasn't at all sure that he didn't see something like a plum pudding. At the moment when the sledge stopped, the fox, who was obviously the oldest person present, had just risen to his feet, holding a glass in his right paw, as if he was going to say something. But when the whole party saw the sledge stopping, and who was in it, all the gaiety went out of their faces. The father squirrel stopped eating with his fork halfway to his mouth, and one of the satires stopped with his fork actually in its mouth, and the baby squirrels squeaked with terror. What is the meaning of this? asked the witch queen. Nobody answered. Speak, Furman, she said again. Or do you want my dwarf to find you a tongue with his whip? What is the meaning of all this gluttony, this waste, this self-indulgence? Where did you get all of these things? Please, your majesty, said the fox. We were given them. And if I might make so bold as to drink your majesty's very good health. Who gave them to you, said the witch. F F Father Christmas, stammered the fox. What? roared the witch, springing from the sledge and taking a few strides nearer to the terrified animals. He has not been here. He cannot have been here. How dare you? But no, say you have been lying and you shall even now be forgiven. At that moment, one of the young squirrels Lots lost its head completely. He has, he has, he has, it squeaked, beating its little spoon on the table. Edmund saw the witch bite her lips so that a drop of blood appeared on her white cheek. Then she raised her wand. Oh, don't, don't, please don't, shouted Edmund. But even while he was shouting, she had waved her wand. And instantly, where the merry party had been, there were only statues of creatures. One with its stone fork fixed forever halfway into its stone mouth, seated around a stone table on which there were stone plates and a stone plum pudding. As for you, said the witch, giving Edmund a stunning blow on the face, as she remounted the sledge. Let that teach you to ask favor for spies and traitors. Drive on. And Edmund, for the first time in this story, felt sorry for someone besides himself. It seemed so pitiful to think of those little stone figures sitting there all silent, days and all dark nights, year after year, till the moss grew on them, and at last even their faces crumbled away. Now they were steadily racing on again, 
and soon Edmund noticed that the snow, which splashed against them as they rushed through it, was much wetter than it had been all last night. At the same time, he noticed that he was feeling much less cold. It was also becoming foggy. In fact, every minute it grew foggier and warmer. And the sledge was not running nearly as well as it had been running up till now. At first he thought this was because the reindeer were tired. But soon he saw that that couldn't be the re real reason. The sledge jerked and skidded and kept on jolting as if it had struck against stones. And however the dwarf whipped the poor reindeer, the sledge went slower and slower. There also seemed to be a curious noise all around them. But the noise of the driving and jolting and the dwarf shouting as the reindeer prevent, er, at the reindeer prevented Edmund from hearing what it was until suddenly the sledge stuck so fast that it wouldn't go on at all. When that happened, there was a moment's silence. And in that silence, Edmund could at last listen to the other noise properly. A strange, sweet, rustling, chattering noise. And yet not so strange, for he'd heard it before. If only he could remember where. Then, all at once, he did remember. It was the noise of running water. All round them, throughout of sight, there were streams. Chattering, murmuring, bubbling, splashing, and even in the distance, roaring. And his heart gave a great leap, though he hardly knew why, when he realized that the frost was over. And much nearer, there was the drip, drip, drip from the branches of all the trees. And then as he looked at one tree, he saw a great load of snow slide off of it. And for the first time since he had entered Narnia, he saw the dark green of a fir tree. But he hadn't time to listen or watch any longer, for the witch said, Don't sit staring, fool. Get out and help. And of course, Edmund had to obey. He stepped into the snow, but it was really only slush by now, and began helping the dwarf to get the sledge out of the muddy hole it had gone into. They got it out in the end, and by being very cruel to the reindeer, the dwarf managed to get it on the move again, and they drove a little further. And now the snow was really melting in earnest, and patches of green grass were beginning to appear in every direction. Unless you have looked at a world of snow as long as Edmund had been looking at it, you will hardly be able to imagine what a relief those green patches were after the endless white. Then the sledge stopped again. It's no good, your majesty, said the dwarf. We can't sledge in this thaw. Then we must walk, said the witch. We shall never overtake them walking, growled the dwarf. <clears throat> Not with the start they've got. Are you my counselor or my slave, said the witch. Do as you're told. Tie the hands of the human creature behind it and keep hold of the end of the rope, and take your whip, and cut the harness of the reindeer. They'll find their way home. <clears throat> the dwarf obeyed, and in a few minutes, Edmund found himself being forced to walk as fast as he could with his hands tied behind him. He kept on slipping in the slush and mud and wet grass, and every time he slipped, the dwarf gave him a curse and sometimes a flick with the whip. The witch walked behind the dwarf and kept on saying, Faster, faster. <clears throat> Every moment the patches of green grew bigger and the patches of snow grew smaller. 
Every moment, more and more of the trees shook off their robes of snow. Soon, wherever you looked, instead of white shapes, you saw the dark green firs or the black prickly branches of bare oaks and beeches and elms. Then the mist turned from white to gold and presently cleared away altogether. Shafts of delicious sunlight struck down on the forest floor, and overhead you could see blue sky between the treetops. Soon there were more wonderful things happening. Coming suddenly round a corner into a glade of silver birch trees, Edmund saw the ground covered in all directions with little yellow flowers. See landines. The noise of the water grew louder. Presently, they actually crossed a stream. Beyond it, they found snowdrops growing. Mind your own business, said the dwarf when he saw that Edmund had turned his head to look at them, and he gave the rope a vicious jerk. But of course, this didn't prevent Edmund from seeing. Only five minutes later, he noticed a dozen crocuses growing around the foot of an old tree, gold and purple and white. Then came a sound even more delicious than the sound of the water. Close beside the path they were following, a bird suddenly chirped from the branch of a tree. It was answered by the chuckle of another bird a little further off. And then, as if they had been a single... That, that had been a signal, there was chattering and chirping in every direction, and then a moment of full song. And within five minutes, the whole world was ringing with birds' music. And wherever Edmund's eyes turned, he saw birds alighting on branches, or sailing overhead, or chasing one another, or having their little quarrels, or tidying up their feathers with their beaks. Faster, faster, said the witch. There was no trace of the fog now. The sky became bluer and bluer, and now there were white clouds hurrying across it from time to time. In the white glades, there were primroses. A light breeze sprang up, which scattered drops of moisture from the swaying branches and carried cool, delicious scents against the faces of the travelers. The trees began to come fully alive. The larches and birches were covered with green, the laburnums with gold. Soon the beech trees had put forth their delicate, transparent leaves. As the travelers walked under them, the light also became green. A bee buzzed across their path. This is no thaw, said the dwarf suddenly stopping this is spring what are you to what are we to do your winter has been destroyed i tell you this is aslan's doing if either of you mention that name again said the witch he shall instantly be killed chapter 12 peter's first battle while the dwarf and the white witch were saying this, miles away the beavers and the children were walking on, hour after hour, into what seemed a delicious dream. Long ago they had left the coats behind them, and by now they had even stopped saying to one another, Look, there's a kingfisher, or I say, bluebells, or what was that lovely smell? or just listen to that thrush. They walked on in silence, drinking it all in, passing through patches of warm sunlight into cool green thickets and out again into wide mossy glades where tall elms raised the leafy roof far overhead. And then into dense masses of flowering current and among hawthorn bushes where the sweet smell was almost overpowering. They had been just as surprised as Edmund when they saw the winter vanishing and the whole wood passing in a few hours or so from January 
to May. They hadn't even known for certain, as the witch did, that this was what would happen when Aslan came to Narnia. But they all knew that it was her spells which had produced the endless winter, and therefore they all knew when this magic spring began that something had gone wrong, and badly wrong, with the witch's schemes. And after the thaw had been going on for some time, they all realized that the witch would no longer be able to use her sledge. After that, they didn't hurry so much, and they allowed themselves more rest and longer ones. They were pretty tired by now, of course, but not what I'd call bitterly tired, only slow and feeling very dreamy and quiet inside, as one does when one is coming to the end of a long day in the open. Susan had a slight blister on one heel. They had left the course of the big river some time ago, for one had to turn a little to the right, that meant a little to the south, to reach the place of the stone table. Even if this had not been the way, they couldn't have kept to the river valley once the thaw began, for all that melting snow, with all the melting snow, the river was soon in flood, a wonderful, roaring, thundering, yellow flood, and their path would have been under water. And now the sun got low, and the light got redder, and the shadows got longer, and the flowers began to think about closing. Not long now, said Mr. Beaver, and began leading them uphill across some very deep springy moss. It felt nice under their tired feet. In a place where only tall trees grew very wide apart. The climb coming at the end of the long day made them all pant and blow. And just as Lucy was wondering whether she could really get to the top without another long rest, suddenly they were at the top. And this is what they saw. They were on a green open space from which you could look down on the forest spreading as far as anyone could see in every direction, except right ahead. There, far to the east, was something, something twinkling and moving. By gum, whispered Peter to Susan, the sea. In the very middle of this open hilltop was the stone table. It was a great grim slab of gray stone supported on four upright stones. It looked very old, and it was cut all over with strange lines and figures that might be the letters of an unknown language. They gave you a curious feeling when you looked at them. The next thing they saw was a pavilion pitched on one side of the open place. A wonderful pavilion it was, and especially now when the light of the setting sun fell upon it, with sides of what looked like yellow silk and cords of crimson and tent pegs of ivory. And high above it on a pole, a banner which bore a red rampant lion fluttering in the breeze, which was blowing in their faces from the far off sea. While they were looking at this, they heard a sound of music on their right, and turning in that direction, they saw what they had come to see. Aslan stood in the center of a crowd of creatures who had grouped themselves round him in the shape of a half moon. There were tree women there, and well women, dryads and naiads, as they used to be called in our world, who had stringed instruments, it was they who made the music. There were four great centaurs. The horse part of them was like huge English farm horses, and the man part was like stern but beautiful giants. There was also a unicorn, a bull with the head of a man, and a pelican, and an eagle, and a great dog. And next to Aslan, 
stood two leopards, of whom one carried his crown and the other his standard. But as for Aslan himself, the beavers and the children didn't know what to do or say when they saw him. People who have been in Narnia sometimes think that a thing cannot be good and terrible at the same time. But the children had ever thought so. If the children had ever thought so, they were cured of it now. For when they tried to look at Aslan's face, they caught a glimpse of the golden mane and the great royal solemn overwhelming eyes. And then they found they couldn't look at him and went all trembly. Go on, whispered Mr. Beaver. No, whispered Peter, you first. No, sons of Adam before animals, whispered Mr. Beaver again. Susan, whispered Peter. What about you? Ladies first. No, you're the oldest, whispered Susan. And of course, the longer they went on doing this, the more awkward they felt. Then at last, Peter realized that it was up to him. He drew his sword and raised it to the salute, and hastily saying to the others, Come on, pull yourselves together. He advanced to the lion and said, We have come, Aslan. Welcome, Peter, son of Adam, said Aslan. Welcome, Susan and Lucy, daughters of Eve. Welcome, he beaver and she beaver. His voice was deep and rich and somehow took the fidgets out of them. They now felt glad and quiet, and it didn't seem awkward to them to stand and say nothing. But where is the fourth? asked Aslan. He has tried to, be, he has tried to betray them. And joined the white witch, O oh Aslan, said Mr. Beaver. And then something made Peter say, That was partly my fault, Aslan. I was angry with him, and I think that helped him to go wrong. And Aslan said nothing either to excuse Peter or to blame him, but merely stood looking at him with his great unchanging eyes. And it seemed to all of them that there was nothing to be said. Please, Aslan, said Lucy, can anything be done to save Edmund? All shall be done, said Aslan, but it may be harder than you think. And then he was silent again for some time. Up to that moment, Lucy had been thinking of how royal and strong and peaceful his face looked. Now it suddenly came into her head that he looked sad as well. But in the next minute, the expression was quite gone. The lion shook his mane and clapped his paws together. Terrible paws, thought Lucy, if he didn't know how to velvet them, and said, Meanwhile, let the feast be prepared. Ladies, take these daughters of Eve to the pavilion and minister to them. When the girls had gone, Aslan laid his paw, and though it was velveted, it was very heavy, on Peter's shoulder and said, Come, son of Adam, I will show you a far-off sight of the castle where you are to be king. And Peter, with a sword still drawn in his hand, went with the lion to the eastern, eastern edge of the hilltop. There a beautiful sight met their eyes. The sun was setting behind their backs. That meant that the whole country below them lay in the evening light, forests and hills and valleys, and winding up like a silver snake, the lower part of the great river. And beyond all this, miles away, was the sea. And beyond the sea was sky, full of clouds with which were just turning rose color with the reflection of the sunset. 
but just where the land of Narnia met the sea, in fact, at the mouth of the great river, there was something on a little hill, shining. It was shining because it was a castle. And of course, the sunlight was reflected from all of the windows which looked toward Peter's and the, Peter in the sunset. But to Peter, it looked like a great star resting on the seashore. That, O oh man, said Aslan, is Ker Paravel of the four thrones, in one of which you must sit as king. I show it to you because you are the firstborn, and you will be the high king over all the rest. And once more Peter said nothing, for at that moment a strange noise woke the silence suddenly. It was like a bugle, but richer. It is your sister's horn, said Aslan to Peter in a low voice, so low as to be almost a purr, if it is not disrespectful to think of a lion purring. For a moment, Peter did not understand. Then, when he saw all the other creatures start forward and heard Aslan say with a wave of his paw, Back, let the prince win his spurs. He did understand, and set off running as hard as he could to the pavilion, and there he saw a dreadful sight. The naiads and dryads were scattering in every direction. Lucy was running towards him as fast as her short legs would carry her, and her face was as white as paper. Then he saw Susan make a dash for a tree and swing herself up, followed by a huge gray beast. At first, Peter thought it was a bear. Then he saw that it looked like an Alsatian, though it was far too big to be a dog. Then he realized that it was a wolf, a wolf standing on its hind legs with its front paws against the tree trunk, snapping and snarling. All the hair on its back stood up, and Susan had not been able to get higher than the second big branch. One of her legs hung down so that her foot was only an inch or two above the snapping teeth. Peter wondered why she did, did not get higher or at least take a better grip. Then he realized that she was just going to faint and that if she fainted, she would fall off. Peter did not feel very brave indeed. He felt he was going to be sick, but that made no difference to what he had to do. He rushed straight up to the monster and aimed a slash of his sword at its side. That stroke never reached the wolf. Quick as lightning, it turned round, its eyes flaming and its mouth wide open in a howl of anger. If it had not been so angry that it simply had to howl, it would have got him by the throat at once. As it was, though all this happened too quickly for Peter to think at all, he had just time to duck down and plunge his sword as hard as he could between the brute's forelegs and into his heart. Then came a horrible, confused moment, like something in a nightmare. He was tugging and pulling, and the wolf seemed neither alive nor dead, and its barred teeth knocked against his forehead, and everything was blood and heat and hair. A moment later, he found that the monster lay dead, and he had drawn his sword out of it, and was straightening his back and rubbing the sweat off of his face and out of his eyes. He felt tired all over. Then, after a bit, Susan came down the tree. She and Peter felt pretty shaky when they met, and I won't say there wasn't kissing and crying on both sides. But in Narnia, no one thinks any the worse of you for that. Quick, quick, shouted the voice of Aslan. Centaurs, eagles, I see another wolf in the thickets. 
there behind you. He has just started away after him, all of you. He will be going to his mistress. Now is your chance to find the witch and rescue the fourth son of Adam. And instantly with a thunder of hoofs and beating of wings, a dozen or so of the swiftest creatures disappeared into the gathering darkness. Peter, still out of breath, turned and saw Aslan close at hand. You have forgotten to clean your sword, said Aslan. It was true. Peter blushed when he looked at the bright blade and saw it smeared with the wolf's hair and blood. He stooped down and wiped it quite clean on the grass and then wiped it quite dry on his coat. Hand it to me and kneel, son of Adam, said Aslan. And when Peter had done so, he struck him with the flat of the blade and said, Rise up, Sir Peter, wolf's bane, and whatever happens, never forget to wipe your sword.